going to be breaking down how I recreated this awesome effect from Tron Ares, or using Houdini and Octane. This might look complex, but it's really only made up of six key parts. The mesh, the grid texture on the mesh, large voxels, small voxels, some digital lines, and of course the background, all animating into existence. So let's create the perfect system. But first, let's watch the original shot from the movie. Man, that was cool. Now the first element we're gonna tackle is this outer skin of our character. I've got my model here imported into Houdini. I've just positioned him where I want and uh, yeah, took his helmet off. Sorry, he's safe. All right, next up is the fun part, creating that infection or growth effect that kind of crawls across the surface and reveals the geometry. This is where a lot of the magic happens. To kick this off, I've scattered a heap of points all over the surface of our mesh. Think of it like seeding the area where our growth is gonna spread. Then we need to tell Houdini where this whole infection should start from. I selected a starting zone using a sphere and the mask from geometry node and named that attribute temperature. Then it's simulation time. For that, I use the pyro source spread. I'll flash my settings up on the screen here for you because going through that every single number would bore us to tears, right? What I was really aiming for was to get a slightly distorted, almost organic spreading shape across all of those points. Using a bit of noise on the diffusion settings helps create these slower and faster areas in the spread, which just breaks it up. It makes it look way more natural and less, you know, perfectly uniform. Then we clean and cache this out to disk. Quick sidebar here about optimization. You're probably gonna see a lot of these bright pink nodes floating around in my scene. And these are my little optimization heroes whether it's freezing geometry or attributes to a single frame so Houdini doesn't have to think so hard, or removing attributes I'm not using anymore. These guys are all about making the scene run quicker. Honestly, this isn't something I know to do from the start. It's usually when my computer just slams to a halt and I think, all right, I need to start optimizing here. All right, back to our temperature attribute. So the raw output from this simulation is usually pretty wild. Like the values might be between zero and like 150 which we can see here, and they just keep climbing. So let's remap those values in between zero and one to be more manageable later. And like Apple product boxes, let's just keep the original attribute around just in case and rename the new one to temp mask. Clamping down our large values gives us a nice gradient, larger the input range, larger the output gradient. Then to make it look a little bit less perfect, I threw some noise on top to break it up. All right, retiming time because Simulations rarely come out timed perfectly to what you need. Using the retime node, for this shot, the big goal was to make sure that the gradient always followed the camera movement that I'd set up earlier, just like it did in our reference. Okay, so we've got the cool simulation data. Now we need to chuck it onto our original character mesh. And for that, the attribute transfer node is our best friend. This basically copies the temp mask and temperature, mind you, information onto our character. Here's where things get a little bit clever. I've got this cool little node set up. It actually trims away the parts of the geometry where the temp mask attribute is below a certain value, like 0.5. Now this sounds simple, but it was actually a little bit tricky because our old mate clip node in Houdini really only likes to cut things on a flat plane. It's not so great with complex shapes. So the workaround that I found on CG Wiki was to convert the position of all our geometry points into 2D or UV space. And then using the temp mask attribute, I can push the geometry back in 3D space. This way the clip node thinks it's cutting a flat plane in that UV space. And then we restore our position to its original position. And bam, just like that, it creates a super nice clean cut of the mesh. Seriously comparing that to using this ugly old blast node, it's so much better. To make it even smoother, we can use the cheeky little blur on the temp mask attribute just before the cut. And this helps soften that edge a little bit more. And then of course, cache it out again. And from this, I output two versions. One of just the straight simulation effect on our mesh, and another with full geometry and old mate's helmet back on. All right, that skin reveal looks cool, but we still need to get that grid texture on the mesh to really nail this aesthetic. So how I tackled it was merging our clean mesh, gave that temp mask attribute a little blur again. Then I used a carve node, which converts our geometry into lines. 
Now, once I had this grid, then I can use that blast node to strategically remove parts of the grid that we're never actually gonna see. Another one of those little optimization tricks. Okay, materials. This is where we really start to nail the look. First up for the base mesh, this is super simple. It's just a shiny black material. Sleek, classic, looks good. But then for all our bright glowing grid stuff, this texture is on that grid object we just made. And the trusty temp mask attribute comes in to save the day again. I used it to drive the color variation in the glow, making it hotter and more orange the closer it is to the edge, and then having it fade off to a deeper red. And of course, use the temp mask again to drive the opacity of the grid. This makes the front edge really bright and fully visible and then smoothly fades off like we have in our reference. And then right at the top, I isolated the tip of the advancing edge and cranked up the brightness just to give it that little extra bright tip. And with that, the skin is done. And let's move on to the voxels. All right, voxels, what's a voxel? Well, it's not quite a vox and it's not quite a pixel, but boy, is it 3D. For this effect, the voxels are made up of two main parts. We've got these larger, more substantial voxels in the middle, and then a whole bunch of smaller, more detailed ones filling out the outside. And the arms, oh yeah, they've gone full small voxel mode, which I think looks super cool. The whole idea here is that the character's fleshy body digitally transferring into the real world, while the clothes, as we saw with the mesh, get that cleaner, sharp cut bit of contrast, which is always fun. To get this, I pretty much stripped everything else off the model. That sounds a bit rough out of context. Anyway, I converted our character into a VDB, a volumetric representation, and then shrunk it down just a tad. This was super important to make sure the voxels would actually sit under that main mesh we were building earlier. No one likes intersecting geometry. Now from this main VDB, we need to create those two layers. The inner layer gets shrunk down even a bit more. And I also lopped off his arms for this specific layer. It kind of reminds me of that, that knight from Monty Python. It was like, it is but a scratch. And for the outer layer, I did this clever little subtraction. I took our main VDB and basically carved out that inner layer we just made, adding a slight offset though, but with this nice thick arms made out of the outer voxel layer. Then it was time to scatter the points inside each of these volumes the thick inner part and the hollow outer arm part. I played around with the density, making the inner volumes less dense and the points on the outer ones more packed together. Then I copied some simple cubes onto all those points. And here's a cool trick. Their scale actually matches the density of the points in that area. So where it's denser, you get smaller cubes, less dense, slightly bigger cubes. And just like that, bam, we've got a basic structure of our voxel visual. But of course, these voxels can't just be there, right? They need to animate on. So that's back to our old mate, the infection solver. You know the drill by now. This setup is nearly identical to what we did before. The main difference is the points for this infection simulation are scattered through the volume of our character. We kick off the infection from the same starting point as before, and then just let it spread like wildfire through all those 3D scattered points. Once that looked good, Little quick cleanup of all the attributes we don't need and say it with me now, cache it out. Now using the attribute copy node, I copied the temperature attribute over to our inner and outer voxel points. And just like we did with the main mesh, I added a touch of noise to break things up, remapped those temperature values to a nice zero to one range and renamed it to our good old friend temp mask. Consistency is key. This time around though, we do something a little different. When that temp mask has a value of zero, we delete all the points. Why? Because we don't want to see them until the infection actually reaches them. And that is the fundamental base of our voxel animation. It's looking good. Okay, but here's where it gets extra fun in my opinion. Using Mops Randomize, which is a fantastic node for adding, well, randomization. And our cheeky little temp mask attribute, we create this cool ramp effect on the scale of the cubes. What that means is when the temp mask is zero, the cubes can take the values of this randomized node. But when the temp mask hits one, they transition to the original intended scale. I also use it to mess with the rotation and a slight change to their position as they animate on. All these little things together, that's what gives us the complete dynamic, almost assembling themselves effect we're going for. It's these little touches that really bring it to life, right? 
Next up, I added an animated noise attribute. This basically gives us a nice noise over all the points. And trust me, this will come in super handy when we get to texturing. I pretty much applied all the same techniques to the smaller voxels as well. And when you combine them all, get a load of this. It's really starting to come together now, right? Of course, a bit more optimization though. Got to remove any voxels that are completely hidden by the main mesh, because why render what you can't see? Every little bit helps keep the scene lighter and our renders faster. Future you will thank past you for this, trust me. Okay, so the next part does get a bit complicated, but it's for a good cause. I noticed in the reference that the center of the large voxels seem to animate on slightly ahead of the outer parts. It's a subtle thing, but it adds depth. So naturally I was like, I've got to do this as well. This meant I needed like a mask that would go from the center of our character to the edge. And this, this is why I love Houdini. So often the data you need is just already there. You just have to figure out how to tap back into it. In this case, the model came with a rig and I realized I could use the bone structure as the core of that mask. My initial plan was to be like, oh, I'll just have to painstakingly draw a custom curve for this. But uh, nope, using that mask from geometry node from before, pointing it at the rig's central bones, I could create that mask effect that spread outwards so much easier. Now this is where it gets a little funky though, but stick with me. I basically created a delayed version of our main temp mask animation by about 50 frames. Then using this center the edge mask attribute we just made, I could blend between the original simulation and this new delayed version. It's a bit wild, but it's totally worth it. For those smaller voxels, particularly in the arms, I needed to isolate the center of the arm for some slight texturing later. So for that, I used a slightly shrunk down VDB to be able to select those central points. Again, this will make a lot more sense when we hit textures, which speaking of, Let's get into them. This is where we really dial in that Tron glow. I used a simple texture of a circle, which I mapped onto the cubes. This circle texture then drives the color and brightness. The idea is to give it a realistic hot look that kind of cools down as it gets to the corners of the cube. Then using the other attributes we set up earlier, remember those animated noise and the inner mask that I made? Using them, I could make it so only a few specific cubes got that super hot treatment, while the rest stay more of a shiny metal black. The trick was to concentrate these hot voxels towards the character's center and sprinkle in some randomization so it didn't look so uniform. It's all about controlled chaos. It was pretty much the exact same story for the smaller voxels. The main difference for these though, I really only wanted the ones closest to the front edge, the inner core of the arm, and a few random ones, thank you noise, to get that hot. And then when you put it all together, well, look at that. Looks good. All that's left is a few small but important parts we really need to nail this look. You may have noticed these cool digital looking lines that kind of appear first emanating from our character with a touch of glow. Well, I actually created a nifty little rig to generate these procedurally. So they perfectly match the shape of the body. It's pretty sweet. And I did that with four loops. Actually, if you're interested in learning about four loops in Houdini, I've got a little video on that on my channel, just saying. This rig basically looks at those large voxel points we made for the body. And it goes through each row of those points and selects a single point from each. Then it draws a line connecting those selected points. And because the original points are pretty evenly spaced, the lines end up feeling very structured and digital. And then using a for each loop this time, they're so cool. I created a bunch of different variations of these lines just by randomly changing which point gets selected in each row through each iteration. Then we can use our carve node again, but in a different way this time to animate the lines on like they're being drawn on essentially or trim paths. And while I was at it, I created a curve view attribute, which basically gives me a gradient running along the length of each line. It's super useful for texturing, which will be coming up soon. And I just did the same process for the lines in the arm as well. I was pretty bloody happy with the result. I'm not gonna lie, it just, uh, it worked. The texture for these lines is super simple. But thankfully, <laughs> at this point, that curve view attribute, I use it to drive the color. And you know the drill by now, more orange and the hotter towards the end of the line. And then I isolated the very tip to make like a very intense, bright hot spot. 
put it all together with the mesh and everything, and now we're talking. But to finish this scene off, I modeled a little bed for old mate to lay on, and then I added some simple glowing lines in the background. They actually serve a bit as the main source of lighting and reflection in the scene, along with the light coming from the illuminated voxels and glowing mesh, of course. Chuck in a little HDR for some subtle ambient light tinted red, of course. And as far as this 3D scene goes, we're, we're done. And you know what? This looks pretty good straight out of the box here with Octane. Especially with a bit of bloom added to the render, we're, we're selling that vibe pretty good. But always, I want more control. So you guessed it, some compositing time it is. I rendered out a multi-layered EXR file with some AOVs, which is fantastic because it gives me holdout mats for pretty much every object and effect in the scene. Total control, here we come. I brought all of that into After Effects. And then it was just a case of giving each element a slight grade and to make it pop. And then adding a grade over the top, of course, then adding some nicely controlled glow to recapture that bloom effect, but with a bit more precision and faster to render. And it's done. It took a bit, but we did it. It's done. That's how I tackled this Tron Aries effect. It was a bit of a journey, but we got there in the end and I'm so stoked with how it turned out. What was your favorite part? Was there a technique that you found particularly cool? Let me know. And if you want to be able to poke around the guts of this thing, I've got the project file on Gumroad. The link's in the description.